Have you ever wondered if buying imported guitars are worth it? Does the simple fact of where something is made justify the price and why it holds more value? And more importantly, what are the pro engineers and your favorite players actually using in the studio? Today, we're gonna get to the bottom of this. My friends, today we are back at Make Believe Studios and it actually turns out that this place exists, which is a bit of an oxymoron. I'm here today with Rick Carson. Hey, one of them be here. What we wanna talk about today is a pretty interesting topic for guitarists, USA guitars versus imports. And the reason that this came to my mind is when I walked in the studio, you guys have no idea how many guitars are in the studio, by the way. You see this, but there's another rack over here, and there's like 10 more guitars in the kitchen. I guess my whole point is I was looking through these and I noticed that there are guitars that range in price astronomically. If you had to go off the top of your head, what would be your cheapest guitar that you have here in the most expensive? Our cheapest guitar is probably either gonna be this Squire Bullet over here that I've had since I was about 12 years old. It's probably worth about $89 or the National Nylon String Acoustic. It's actually, it's not a National, it's a Kingston. That thing's probably about a hundred bucks. And our most expensive guitar is probably gonna be, you know, roughly 10, $12,000, but there's a, you know, a guitar here that I would consider, you know, one of a kind, irreplaceable, so. Okay, so basically the price goes all the way from $100 to irreplaceable. And the reason I wanna bring this up is there's some really dope sounding guitars. I was just playing this Epiphone that you have over there, and I noticed that you have a lot of Gibsons. What makes that Epiphone earn its space on that guitar rack? You know, the Epiphone that you're playing in particular is um, an early 2000s limited edition Les Paul Deluxe. And besides the fact that it has a lot of sentimental value to me, that's, you know, my second guitar. If that was one of my first guitars. That was actually the first nice guitar that I had, the first set neck guitar. I acquired that guitar in pieces where I, you know, purchased the pickup from my, fr my friend Billy Cox for $20. He was like, yeah, I'll sell you my neck pickup because I don't play in, I don't use it in my ska band. And I was like, cool, dude, that, that's fine. I'll take the neck pickup. And I put it in the bridge of my SG that I had, which was like a, a very, you know, bolt on Epiphone SG. And uh, he came back and he was like, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the rest of the guitar for this, you know, keyboard that you have. I want to play keyboard in my ska band. I was like, oh yeah, yeah. So I bought the guitar and then put the, the pickup back in. But why, why is it here? One. I think it holds its own as far as it's been upgraded with locking tuners and it's been upgraded with, you know, Graftech saddles in the bridge. So it holds tune very well. And then the other side of it is that, you know, those pickups that they used in that guitar were American made because Epiphone wasn't making many humbuckers at the time. So they're American made Gibson pickups and they sound great and mini humbuckers a lot of people think that they're just smaller versions of humbuckers but they're not they're truly their own individual design with their own individual tone that i am a very big fan of you know i would have to say that you know i personally like mini humbuckers better than humbuckers and every single guitar in here almost has humbuckers in it and that's the only one with many humbuckers. So you can tell how biased I am towards that guitar. Yeah, cause I mean, I see there's Rickenbackers back here. Like I said, there's Gibson's Galore, basically any guitar that you can imagine. Another thing I wanna bring up too in this, this whole debate of when you're dealing with imports or you're dealing with USA made, the Sterling bass that you have over there. How often does that get pulled up and used on an album? So that's actually Ryan Harvey's bass. And you know, it gets used a lot. You know, it holds tune very, very well when being set up for lower tunings. And it kind of lives as like the bass that is lower than, you know, pretty much standard or a half step down. If anything's going down, it's probably gonna be that thing. And it does a great job at it. You know, I've got no complaints with the way that it sounds or its intonation. To me, it sounds very, very similar to what I would expect out of a music man, you know, with a price that makes it reasonable for almost everybody in the world and i don't feel bad about having it in the studio and letting people use it see i think that brings a really interesting thought to my mind because 
in my studio, you know, I, I have my Gibson Les Paul. I have some Epiphones. People tend to always go for the Gibson. I think my Epiphone sounds great. I've upgraded the pickups in it. I actually switched the hum bucking out for a P94, which is just a P90 inside of the humbucker casing inch size. To me, that thing rips. It's I, I pick that thing up and I'll play it more than my Gibson. But when you have people coming in and they're looking for the next shiny thing, they don't always gravitate towards something just because you say that it sounds good. So has there ever been an instance when you've been in the studio and somebody went to go grab a guitar, let's say that it was a Gibson, and you said, actually, I want you to try this out. And it was a guitar that they didn't think was gonna sound as good as it did. Yeah, you know, absolutely. That's definitely happened where, you know, you hand someone what I would consider a lesser quality instrument than what they're used to, but it ends up being like the whole last sound on the record. You know, we have a harmony guitar here that is, you know, completely terribly awful to play, but, it's the guitar that Tom Petty recorded Wildflowers on and it sounds like that and there's nothing else here that can do that and no matter how many times that thing has exploded, you know, I continue to pay this dude in town to glue it back together for me. <laughs> you know, it's got more battle scars than the majority of these things in here and it's awful to play, but it's just the sound, you know? so. Sometimes you can't get away from those things. And then there's the other side of it too, where, you know, I've had people who come in here and nothing in here is good enough for them. There's gotta be like 30 guitars in here. There, there was a dude who worked here for years, you know, and it finally just got to the point where like, I remember when I finally f had it with the guy was the day that I picked up this Princeton. You know, I went, and I called him, I was like, hey man, you know, he his whole thing is he always wanted a Princeton reverb, you know? And I remember I called him, I was like, hey man, I just picked up a Princeton that we could use at the studio. And he was like, send me a photo of it. I sent him a photo of it. He didn't say anything. So I called him and this was the dude who worked it with me day to day, like Ryan does now, you know? And I called him and I was like, hey, what do you think, man? He's like, Oh, it doesn't have reverb. Like, <laughs> dude, like we have a 1963 Fender Spring Reverb in the back and the Princeton and you could connect them together, but f me, <laughs> like, <laughs> nothing's good enough, you know? And those people absolutely exist. That is really true. A lot of times people are thinking that there is some instrument or some piece of gear that's going to solve the problem when they are the problem. It's like, if you don't know how to use an EQ, it doesn't matter whether you have um, some the Pro Tool stock EQ or if they have your Sontech EQ or whatever the case is, if they don't know what they're doing with it, then it's not like something's gonna magically work. But for the people that do know how to use those things to their full potential, they're gonna get the most out of it. You know, and it was just very interesting in a situation like the one with him, cause it was like, that was the sort of dude who had access to everything in here. And he was very talented at what he did, but you know, rather than use this Princeton and add some reverb to it, he's like searching through every Kemper profile of Princeton reverbs Oops. in the world, trying to get a tone he's happy with. I totally get what you're saying. And that's, that's the thing that also goes when I'm thinking of guitars, you could go for something that's tried and true. I know if I'm looking for something that's in the, the dad rock world, I know I could pick up a Gibson with a humbucker in it or, or a P90. And I know I'm gonna be able to get myself mostly there. I know if I'm trying to get something quacky, I'm gonna to wanna to reach for a Strat or something like that. Just, we had a conversation off camera talking about this a little bit. And there's instruments that just have a certain feel and vibe to them because that's what they're designed to do. And if people were able to just get past that thought of where other people are buying expensive things, they'd be able to get further along in their career. Worry less about how much something costs and spend more time practicing getting better at your instrument or getting better at your skills if you're trying to be an aspiring mixing engineer, mastering engineer, whatever the case may be. And can we talk a little bit about what you think of the build quality that comes between a USA made guitar and an import because I think that's a big part that people worry about. People love talking about the frets and whether they're going to be sharp on the edge of stuff like that. What have you come across in that realm? I believe that, you know, a person can make a great guitar anywhere in the world. 
You know, I don't think that it has anything to do with where the guitar is actually manufactured. A lot of it has to do with what it's constructed with. And sometimes, you know, if they're trying to make guitars out of plywood, you're not going to end up with an instrument that may be as great as something that's made out of a nicer piece of wood. But you may end up with something that's absolutely wonderful and totally usable. So it shouldn't be completely ruled out, in my opinion. And, you know, a lot of people want to talk about plywood, but, you know, let's not kid ourselves and act like a Gibson 335 isn't made out of a three ply binding piece of wood for its top. You know, like that, I mean, they make the plywood, but it's a piece of <laughs> plywood, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's nicer because the way that they go about constructing it and stuff like that, it's not chipboard. You know, they're actually long sheets of ply, but I mean, still a, a piece of plywood. And, you know, for me to kid myself, and say that this guitar is better than that guitar, that's not true. What comes down to is how someone connects with the instrument. And if they enjoy and appreciate their time they spend with the instrument. And I think that great guitars can be made absolutely anywhere. That being said, there's definitely places I look for instruments from. You know, I'm a big fan of Japanese instruments. I'm a big fan of American instruments from Michigan, you know, particularly things that were made in the, the 50s and 60s. But that's not just Gibsons, you know, there are great, great Epiphone guitars that were made here in America, in New York, and Gips in, at the Gibson factory in Kalamazoo. They're just as good as any Gibson guitar, you know? and. When we listen to these songs, you know, I bring up the Beatles and throughout these videos that we've been talking about, I keep referencing the Beatles because I think it's a good thing to reference back on for anybody who wants to do this job. But those aren't Gibsons for the majority of those sounds. Sure, you know, George played his Red Les Paul, but the majority of that stuff, if there's a, you know, a guitar from Kalamazoo, Michigan, it's an Epiphone, you know, and there's, George and John's casinos and the really big star of the show in my opinion was Paul McCartney's you know Texan that acoustic guitar I mean that is the sound that we know of the Beatles acoustic guitar for the most part and that's a guitar that was sold as like a budget a more cheap model back in the 60s and today they're thousands and thousands of dollars and even the ones that Epiphone make today as limited edition ones sell for thousands and thousands of dollars and I'm supposed to believe that everything else that they made, except for this one particular model that the Beatles ended up liking, was just a little bit here than everything Gibson ever made. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just doesn't it doesn't work out for me that way. You know, and some of it comes down to bias. Some some comes down from growing up without a lot of money. You know, I love my Epiphone. My buddy Dan had this Gibson. That was his Gibson. That was my Epiphone, and we grew up with each other in Michigan. And you know, I didn't buy a Gibson Les Paul that I owned for more because you've seen it, like. I buy and sell guitars, I buy and sell equipment. You've watched that happen today, yeah. you know? 100%. Um, I didn't own an Epi or a Gibson Les Paul for myself for more than a month until I started this facility in this location in 2016. You know, and that's the black Les Paul that's out there, you know? And I love that guitar. That's my Les Paul. There's been seven Les Pauls that have come through the building in the past six months. There was one, a Les Paul traditional from 2014 that everybody in the building was like, keep this one and get rid of like the shop guitar. And I was like, no, <laughs> you know, I, I'm happy, but there's certain things that are disruptors. You know, I have a, you know, guitar that I put together that was set up to be like a 1969 Stratocaster that was fully David Gilmore'd out. And I got a 1982 American vintage reissue 1957 Stratocaster that we call Steamy Ray Vaughn. And, you know, my OG Strat, like it's not here, it's been sold, you know? Um, and it was set up just to match that Les Paul where it had the Make Believe logo on it and stuff. And, that guitar is with an old intern, you know, who you met earlier today, Devin, and you know, 
I have a new strat that I call Steamy Ray Vaughn. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of disruptor, pretty much any guitar that I put through that thing sounds amazing. And this guy right here was one of the people making the cabs for that along with Ryan Harvey. So if you guys are enjoying that, just know that he and Ryan were the brains behind getting the cab section done for that in a stellar way. So thank you for that. Thank you everyone us and letting us be involved in that. It was uh, a lot of fun. And you know, that was pretty much just me and Ryan. That was one of the first things that we did when he got here. And you know, we hung out for, you know, I can't remember how long it took us, but I remember we were drawing, <laughs> we ended up drawing speakers, you know, and, and like placements, you know, on this whiteboard. And we just started making butthole jokes for a <laughs> while, so. <laughs> Me being in the studio most of the time, I care a little bit more about how a guitar sounds than the way that it feels. But that's not necessarily true for the people that are coming in trying to play the thing, right? When you're out hunting and looking for a guitar, or whether you're gonna buy one, or you're gonna try and sell it later or trade for whatever, what are the things that you're really looking for, especially on a cheaper end guitar? Well, on a cheaper end guitar, you know, the things that I tend to be looking for really come down to vintage. You know, if it's a guitar that's gonna be under $1,000, and I'm interested in buying it, it's usually because it comes from a time period in particular that's very, very interesting to me, you know? And there's a couple of those, um, you know, between 81 and 84, the Stratocasters that were made in Fullerton and the Stratocasters that were made in Japan, you know? So these are the JV series Stratocasters and then things like the SQ series Squires, you know? Um, those things are very interesting to me. And then you get into things like there was a very short time period run where, you know, Squires were actually made in America. They made made America Squires Stratocasters. Um, there's actually one for sale here locally on Craigslist right now for $600. And the last one that sold on Reverb was a thousand bucks, you know? So it's like a lot- Might of, be scooping that before I leave here. So. A lot of people out, are out there like thinking about thousand dollar Squires. Like every Squire that they see, Squire Stratocaster means 150 bucks. Like always, always 150 bucks. Like you're f***ing off if you don't think that like a quarter of your rent may be sitting out there in a Squire. Like, I don't leave any opportunity like that on the table. Man, you know what? There's a Squire that I have and I love. And it's like, people can say whatever, I care, zero. The J Mascus Squat, bro, that Squire is unbelievable. See, and you know, I think that the J Mascus is a very interesting, you know, thing in the sense that one, he put together a guitar that was what he wanted. The accoutrement of how the control layout is laid out, what he wanted out of the neck, how he wanted that guitar to feel, you know, they, did a good job i believe seeing his vision through but then also on the other side of it is the star power of someone like kevin parker picking that guitar up and saying nah i'm good like this is the one for me and that's what happened there if you didn't know that you I, know i didn't know that yeah no. the dude from tame impala that's his main guitar now is the squire j mascus you know with the anodized pit guard and you know I he's got that, he's guard. got other guitars and he played rickenbackers for years and stuff and he's good with his, his j mascus he this is his main guitar that he plays for the majority of his stuff and that to me shows like no offense to Gibson, you know, I want to be team Gibson, but everything they do bums me out. And this is a guy <laughs> who owns like hundreds, has owned hundreds of Gibson guitars and is looking for Gibson guitars every single day. But, you know, okay, we don't have young artist signature models and I got to deal with another $30,000 Kirk Hammett, Gary Moore jerk off session. Like how many slash guitars are there and i'm sorry like you know dude you've made so many guitars for billy joe armstrong that you can't even keep <laughs> did you know that billy joe armstrong had nine signature models from gibson guitar i didn't know it was nine but i knew it was a lot yeah like I know you know i mean like you you they're not even collectible anymore because like no one gives the newest one that came out is actually very interesting to me which is a silver Les Paul Jr. And you wanna know why it's interesting to me? Is because when I was in a band, I used to do a lot of guitar swings and my guitars were like hit 
get all f***ed up and stuff. So I went and bought a, one of those Epiphone Silver Les Paul Juniors and, you know, played the out of that guitar. I actually, when it was sold from here, it had lyrics written all over it. It still had blood on it from shows. And I finally just like sold it for 50 bucks to some crate on Craigslist because like I wasn't going to restore this thing. It was an Epiphone Les Paul Jr. But, you know, now I see this thing and it's like, oh, great. I would love to own a silver Gibson Les Paul Jr. That's awesome. But I'm paying a premium for Billy Joe Armstrong and like no one really gives a shit about his guitars and he's not like turning out records in the sense that people are going to be like super interested in the guitar that came out 13 years after American Idiot like it just it's all so weird to me and there's so much talent so much time that's passed that Gibson could be supporting these artists and then you go out and you see Fender and Fender it seems like every young kid you know whether they're supported by Fender or not is ending up with a Fender because they're still cheap and under a thousand dollars and you can get your hands on them and they sound good so that is a lot of information for people to digest but if it was a thing where you were curious whether you needed to go all-american or you can get away with using an import. I think that we answered that in this discussion because like I said, I probably would guess there's 25, 30 guitars in here. And amongst that, you see things that go down into the import category like Epiphones, like Sterling. So all that stuff is a-okay when, it doesn't even mean when you're just starting out, like at any given point. And I use a Squire myself. Like I play a Squire classic vibe for a couple reasons. One, because I'm left-handed and I don't wanna spend $1,500 on a guitar that only I can play because it doesn't make any sense. And two, because it just sounds awesome. Like I modded it out. I put a Goto bridge in there. There's a humbucker in there. It's kind of like a, a John 5 looking Telecaster. Like that's pretty much how I like mine, but I've never had any issues with it. It records great and people always compliment me on the tones that I'm getting. So if anyone's worried about that, whether you should go USA or import, I say go where your money goes and what you can afford and what makes the most sense and what sounds good to you at the end of the day, because that's what matters. The money doesn't matter. And what other people think doesn't matter. How do you feel about it? Does it sound good to you? Learn how to play stick to that and leave all the other intangibles out of there. The big thing for me, when it comes to buying these guitars, if you're gonna run a commercial studio where people are gonna touch your stuff, you should feel free with whatever you're willing to spend on a guitar, you should be willing to light on fire in half. So if it's 2000 bucks, make sure that you're willing to have it be worth a thousand dollars when you're done with it. That's the one thing I'll say. And I totally agree with you there because like I said, I have my Gibson, I have a, Fender Telecaster. There's some new guitars I'm getting right now, getting a new Strat, getting a new Jazzmaster. But then I'm like, do I really want to do that and then put these out in the hallway? I share my space where everyone has access to them. Nobody's going to take care of my stuff. Nobody's going to care about that. Do I really want to dump that kind of money into that? So Well, and you also brought up another wonderful point, which is you like to modify your guitars, you know, and I like to modify my guitars. And same thing, even if you keep that guitar completely fine and none of your clients put a dinger in it, you know, if you dis decide to change anything where you change a solder point, you're going to be taking, you know, dollars off yeah. of that guitar it's considerable. And there are certain things refinish, you know, routing into the body that's 50 percent off, you know. 100%. Switching out a neck, any type of parts cast, like you might as well just cut the price in half. So you oh, know. you are cutting the price in half. Like yeah. no ifs, ands, or buts. Like you route the inside of that guitar, you change the paint color, I'm paying you half of whatever you think that thing is worth. Yeah. 100%. And that is definitely something to keep in mind. Want to thank you all for watching this episode. Thank you so much, Rick, for being here. And as always, if you're an engineer on the come up, Make sure to give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. You only have to do it one time and tap that bell for notification. So when a video drops, you know the location and make sure to follow Make Believe Studios as well as subscribe to the JST channel. Later.